We're back with Caroline Smith at the Natural History Museum London and we're Hello looking again. at meteorites. Yes, so this, this is a, a very interesting meteorite. This is a meteorite called Murchison, which mm. fell in Australia in September 1969 and is uh, again a very interesting meteorite. It's a very heavily studied meteorite both here at the museum and in institutions around the world. Now this is a chondrite meteorite again, um, so Barwell was also a chondrite but this is what we call a carbonaceous chondrite um, and the reason why we call these meteorites carbonaceous chondrites is because they have quite a lot of carbon in them relatively compared with other meteorites, although interestingly they're not the most carbon rich of all meteorites. Um, and the carbon in these meteorites is actually very interesting because it's very rich. These, these type of meteorites, they're called CM chondrites, um, are actually, the carbon is in organic molecules. A lot of it is in organic molecules. And these organic molecules are very interesting. You get some very interesting types of organic molecules um, in these meteorites. So things like amino acids, sugars, nuclear bases, some really quite complex um, uh, organic molecule species within these, these meteorites. And it's been proven that these, me these organic molecules are actually indigenous to the meteorite. And what I mean by that is this is not terrestrial contamination that's sort of got onto the meteorite or got in there. This is organic molecules that have actually been formed in space or on the parent asteroid that these meteorites came from. Um, and the other thing that's quite interesting about these meteorites is they've got lots of clay minerals in them. So that actually shows that at some point there was water flowing on or within the asteroid that this meteorite came from, probably early in the solar system. So liquid water. Liquid water. So they've been aqueously processed. Mm -hmm. These were wet rocks at some point in their, their life. So very, very interesting because a lot of the organic molecules that we find in these types of meteorites are exactly the sort of organic molecules you need for life. So it's not to say that there is bugs or germs or viruses or anything alive in this meteorite, but all the chemical building blocks you need for life can be found in these meteorites. And we know that the Earth and indeed the whole inner solar system was bombarded by asteroids and comets in the first sort of half, half a billion, so about 500 million years of its existence. And many people think that uh, the bombardment of Earth and potentially other planets like Mars, for example, by materials like this, actually seeded the inner solar system with the chemicals you need for life to start. So that's quite a, an interesting concept to, to think about. So as I said, I stress that this is not life, there's no life, nothing alive in these, but all of the chemistry you need for life is present in rocks like this. And this was the first meteorite in which amino acids were discovered? Well, no, was it no, I mean, it's, there, were, there were amino acids found in other meteorites of this type. So there's a meteorite called, called Cold Bockefelt, um, which is the same type of meteorite, uh, but which fell in 1838. Um, so, you know, 100 and odd years or 100 and what, 30 years before, before this one. The problem was that at that point, the chemistry um, and the analytical techniques were not sophisticated enough to say these amino acids are not from Earth. Mm. So they said, well, we're finding amino acids, but we can't conclusively say that mm -hmm. they are from the meteorite. It's not terrestrial contamination that's got in there. Mm -hmm. And so by the late 1960s, the chemistry was good enough and they had a meteorite which was actually picked up very, very quickly. As I said, it was a witnessed fall in 1969, so they could not completely rule out terrestrial contamination, but it made it much less likely. Mm -hmm. um, and they were actually able to find that the amino acids in here were similar to ones that we have on Earth, but are different enough that they must be not from this Earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why Murchison is so well studied. So there's been lots and lots of studies on the organic chemistry of the Murchison meteorite. And in fact, if you smell it, you can it's, actually... It's a smelly meteorite. It is a smelly yeah. meteorite. It's yeah. got a sort of acrid <laughs> gunpowdery smell. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's a combination of the organics in here volatilising, but also as well the fact that it's got quite a lot of um, sulphide minerals in there. Mm. Again, that they're reacting with the atmosphere and mm -hmm. it's quite sort of acridy smell. Mm -hmm. You're smelling the salt, some of the sulphur atoms. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So it's got a rather smelly smell. Uh, and then, again, this is another very famous meteorite that fell 
coincidentally in 1969 as well. Yeah, if you were a punctry scientist in 1969, <laughs> you know, you were quids in because you had two <coughs> fantastic Excuse meteorite me. falls and then obviously the Apollo samples came back in the July of 69. So this is a very, very famous meteorite, probably as famous and as studied, if not more studied, than Murchison, as we've just seen. This is a piece of the Allende meteorite, and this fell in Mexico in 1969, and a very, very large fireball was seen over most of the southwest US and into Mexico, and pieces actually landed in, in the country of Mexico, in Chihuahua province, so in the north of Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and why this meteorite is very um, important is it's extremely rich in things called CAIs, mm -hmm. and CAI stands for Calcium Aluminium Rich Inclusion, um, and all that means is that the minerals in these CAIs have got a lot of the elements of calcium and aluminium in. And you can see there's a very large CAI actually just on the surface of this sample, but you can also see on the broken face inside the irregularly shaped sort of grey white things mm -hmm. of the CAIs. So END is particularly rich in CAIs. People are very interested in CAIs, so people like to study Yendi because it's got lots of them in and lots of different types as well. So CAIs are very important because they are the things that give us the age of our solar system. So we can actually extract the CAIs from, from meteorites like Yendi and we can actually dissolve them up using strong acids, uh, do various chemistry on them to try and isolate elements like uranium and lead and we can measure the amount of uranium and lead in there, do a process called geochronology or radiometric dating. You need very, very sophisticated instruments to be able to do this. When you say radiometric dating and uranium, people go, oh, it's radioactive. <laughs> it, it is, you know, this rock is actually less radioactive than the surrounding, you know, just the surrounding mm -hmm. air, but you can pick up um, the, the very, very subtle amount of uh, radioactive lead that's still in there from the start of the solar system and then the, the stable daughter product of, of sorry, uranium and, and lead, so the, the radioactive uranium and the uh, stable daughter product of lead, the isotope of lead, and you can actually work out the formation age of the CAIs. And in fact, it's a standard technique that's used to date earth rocks as well. So, mm -hmm. And in fact, when we do that, we get these very old old ages of 4,568, 4,567 million years, so 4.6 billion years. Mm -hmm. And that's the given age of the solar system determined from dating <coughs> the CAIs as we see in the Indy. So is it proper to say that these inclusions uh, predate Earth? Oh yes. Now again, there's a bit of debate on you know how old is the Earth. Mm -hmm. um, but this, the CAIs in here are anywhere between about 50 and 150 million years older than the Earth. Pretty impressive to be holding that in a rock in your hand. Very nice. And then I'll just show one more. Mm -hmm. One more rock from the collection. So I mentioned at the beginning we have achondrites mm -hmm. um, and this is a meteorite called Stannon. It fell in the Czech Republic, which was then part of Austria actually, in 1808. Um, like with Barwell, you can see the beautiful fusion crust. Mm. This one's got a nice shiny fusion crust mm -hmm. um, and this sort of really quite boring concrete grey colour. So in some ways it looks a little bit like Barwell, which is the one that we saw earlier, but in fact this is a completely different type of meteorite. This is called a eucrite and these are very similar to terrestrial basaltic rocks, so the sorts of rocks that you get coming out of volcanoes or being intruded into shallow level intrusions in the Earth's surface. Mm -hmm. um, so because this is <coughs> so similar to terrestrial basalts, terrestrial volcanic rocks, it obviously shows that this has to be from somewhere that was under, that had some sort of melting and this process of differentiation. So the sort of geological processing was beginning. And in fact, this is one of the few types of meteorites where we're pretty confident that we know where it, which asteroid it's come from. And in fact, it's come from the asteroid for Vesta, mm -hmm. um, which has just recently been visited by one of the NASA missions. Mm -hmm. A piece of Vesta. 
And this is something that, uh, is it fair to say that the identification of parent bodies for more meteorites will happen? Yes, in definitely. The future. It's a very difficult problem. It's course, a very, very difficult problem. Things yeah. break up and they uh, accrete and they fall apart and they move around over time. Exactly. So it's extremely complex. But uh, it's so interesting, though, to know that you're holding a piece of Vesta. Absolutely. And so, you know, and again, it just shows that, you know, some of the asteroids really did undergo, you know, we call them planetesimals. These are sort of baby or failed planets. You know, they were, mm -hmm. were beginning to try and become planets, but, you know, for whatever reason that process was, was aborted and, and, and sort of prevented. Um, but, you know, again, studying meteorites like this gives us an insight into those first geological processes, the chemical processing that was going on early in the solar system, mm -hmm. which gives us insights into what our Earth was doing very early on in its history. Um, and, of course, we don't have any terrestrial rocks that date back from that period, so we have to sort of study these types of rocks and use them as a as a proxy for what was actually happening on our Earth. You know, people you know people always say to me, "Oh, well, you know, why, you know, what's, who cares about that? Why do you care about you know what was happening on the early Earth, or you know, why there are organic molecules in in some meteorites?" And as I always say, is that you know one of the big questions that you know humanity wants to know is are we alone you know is there life elsewhere in the solar system is there life elsewhere in the galaxy the cosmos the universe now if we can understand the processes that have shaped our solar system and indeed our earth because as far as we know we are unique we are the only place in the universe where there is life some people say intelligent life i would maybe disagree in some for some of that <laughs> but you know if we can actually understand the processes to how we've got to where we are today, we can apply that knowledge when we do astronomy and look at you know planets around stars and planet forming regions today. So is our you know solar system is it something very very unusual? Are the conditions very unique, which obviously makes the chance of life a little bit more difficult in other places? Or are we a fairly standard you know bog standard solar system, which makes the chance of life much more much more you know possible? Yes. One more thing. Okay. This is one of my favourites. Mm -hmm. And again, this has got a nice story. So, this is a small fragment of the Narkla mm. meteorite. And this is one of our sort of small, small, smaller size fragments. We've got a lot of this in the collection, luckily. So, we saw the Tissint meteorite earlier on. Mm hmm which is a Martian meteorite, and this is another Martian meteorite. This is of the... Of older vintage. Of older vintage, yes, for actually a number of reasons. This is the Narkla meteorite, which fell in Egypt in 1911, June, June the 28th, 1911. And interestingly, Tissant fell in uh, July the 28th, 2011. Mm -hmm. So it was almost, it was a hundred years and a month uh, separating, of separating them. Mm -hmm. But they're different, type, they're different types of Martian meteorites. So you might have noticed on Tissint where the fusion crust is bashed off, it's a sort of grey inside, whereas mm -hmm. this is a very distinct sort of olivey green khaki colour. And it's mm -hmm. because it's the different mineral composition. This is very rich in a mineral called um, clinopyroxene. Mm. Um, so again, if I turn it over on the outside, you can see the very beautiful black fusion crust, mm. very similar to Tissant. Nice flow lines. Yeah, it's really nice. There mm -hmm. were some lovely flow lines on the stand, actually. I don't know if you mm -hmm. saw those. Mm -hmm. And then this is the beautiful, um, it's a really nice crystalline uh, mm -hmm. colour inside. Now, the reason why this meteorite is quite famous is reputedly one of the stones... It's not because it killed a dog. No, because there okay. was... I think the dog-killing story is somewhat <laughs> apocryphal, <laughs> to right. be quite honest. Right. Um, now... You know, do you believe that a dog was killed? No. I don't. Um, be <laughs> partly because when the the people were said, well, you know, where is the dog? And they said, oh, there's no there's no corpse because it vaporized. Yeah. Now, of course, that's yeah. a popular misconception. That, that's a that's a good trick. That meteorites yeah. Yeah. are you know burning hot when they land on <laughs> right. Earth. They're not right. actually. Um, but so you know, possibly the dog had its back broken or you know mm -hmm. head caved in, but uh, it certainly didn't vaporize. Mm -hmm. So you know that's why there's a lot of doubt as to whether this actually happened. Um, 
so it's famous because it's the one that killed a dog, even though, as I said, I don't think any, <laughs> any, any no dogs died in the making of this meteorite. Right. <laughs> um, but what it is famous for is that um, in the late 1970s, or mid to late 1970s, this, this rock was heavily studied, funnily enough, by the same chap who discovered the Barwell pebbles, Robert mm. Hutchison. Mm. And he noticed that um, many of the, the olivine grains in this had been... Um, uh, there were veins of clay minerals. Now, clay is formed when you have a mineral like olivine, which is a iron magnesium silicate. We saw mm -hmm. the olivine in the Imalac sample. Mm -hmm. um, when you when you you get olivine wet, water can go into cracks, and there will be a reaction, and clay minerals will form. Mm -hmm. So you you only have clay minerals when you have water. Mm -hmm. So he noticed that there was lots of clay minerals in this meteorite. Now, that, to be fair, had been noticed before, but people had said, well, it must be just from hanging around on Earth, it's picking up moisture moisture from, from the atmosphere. But Bob was able to show, using a combination of very detailed mineralogy, so showing exactly where these veins were and the relationships with other veins and sort of with the edges of crystals, things like that, mm -hmm. and also chemically that, no, these veins were again they were natural to this meteorite mm -hmm. they were there before this meteorite even landed on earth mm -hmm. now the reason why that is obviously such a spectacular piece of uh, detective work is that of course this is a meteorite from mars so that work showed that at least at some point in mars's history there was liquid flowing or there was liquid water available to cause the alteration that we that we see in this meteorite mm -hmm. now you know you say that and, and, and people go, oh, yeah, well, NASA's found liquid water on Mars. It's like NASA finds liquid water on Mars about five, five or six times a year. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we're very proud to say, actually, the first conclusive published proof of liquid water in a Martian sample was actually done looking at this meteorite by a scientist here at the museum. And this so was... we like to say that the British discovered water on Mars. Ah, oh, very nice, very nice. But you know, again, people people might say, well, why is water important? You know, why is water important? Um, and there are certain things that we we can scientific you know conclusions we can come to from um, from actually looking at life on Earth and the environments in which we have life. And you know, it's it's sort of pretty you know pretty much agreed that you need to have water present to have life. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why. Mars is such an interesting place to go to is that we're increasingly understanding that Mars was very wet in the past and indeed there may be brief periods of liquid water present if not on the surface of Mars maybe just below the surface of Mars today. Studying this meteorite was really the the opening salvo of the question why did Mars go from warm and wet to cold and dry? Yeah exactly exactly. That's big stuff. It is big stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very, very much. This has been really fantastic. Caroline Smith, I really right. thank you for taking the time to meet with us today and no to worries. show us some of the highlights of the collection no of the Natural History Museum. My pleasure. Thank you very much, and uh, hi, say hi to the readers. Hello. <laughs> <laughs>